Hello, Kim, Paul, and Amy. Thank you so much for your time today and for accepting the invitation to join our Advertising Europe episode. As representatives of Appraise and Work, respectively, you have just launched a study showing that stronger relationships build a stronger business. Here at EACA, we are committed to promoting and driving effectiveness in the industry. And together with our members, we very much welcome this initiative. This is why we would love to know more about the idea behind it, the results it yields, and the impact these findings have on our industry. Um, with that in mind, I would love to ask the first question to you, Kim. What was the inspiration behind the study? Right. Well, um, as a consultancy, we are single-mindedly focused on the principle that stronger relationships build stronger business, uh, that it's better to repair than to replace. Um, and so whenever we get an opportunity to prove that principle, uh, we jump at it. And uh, the, the discovery of this walk data was uh, a, 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 you know, a very exciting moment for us. You know, we don't handle pitches or do searches. Um, and so because of that single-minded focus, uh, we're always looking for opportunities to prove the hypothesis that stronger relationships build stronger business. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kim. Then maybe, Paul, could you tell us more a little bit um, how many people have worked on the research and for how long, just to set a little bit the scene? Yeah, no problem. Um, just to bounce on what start from where, where, where Kim said, uh, a while ago, before we started this analysis, uh, a couple of our clients shared with us the, the fact that they'd won some efforts. Uh, and we, we kind of thought for them individually, we, we sort of said, oh, well, let's just see how your winning re relationships, the ones, you know, the ones that uh, you've just told us have won, have, have won some efforts. Let's see how they compare to the scores with, with, with the rest of your evaluations. Uh, and, and we could see within that, you know, within the, the small numbers, just for those those clients we were working with, those specific clients who came to us with the, that same information, that uh, that their their winners were scoring higher than than the rest on on, on average. And it's kind of like was a thought that lodged in the back of our mind that actually that was you know wouldn't it be great if at some point we could do a much bigger uh, analysis on that? And it also meant that when uh, when Kim and, and, and kind of connected through with, with Walk and Amy and brought me in, I was kind of like, yes, you know, th there's a we've done this in, in micro before. Here's our opportunity to actually do it fully and, and properly. Um, the, the work really started with Amy and her team in the sense that without without all this list, these, this, this very well listed and documented set of awards, uh, we wouldn't we would have been nowhere. Um, and it then really came to me, uh, and I spent quite a long time uh, sort of doing a few hundred every week uh, of going through and just comparing every award winner with our database, which was quite a painstaking you know process, which which took took place over or three four months, something like that, just doing a you know <clears throat> trying to do a few hundred every day every week sort of thing to uh, to, to trawl through it. Um, then. We then obviously reached out and used the power of computers to, once we got the match, to actually do the, you know, to build the analysis and do the analysis, which was thrown up into a big graphical dashboard, which we uh, initially did it on. But then, then what I did was, as you do with any good sort of data mining, you will take an initial hypothesis, you will collect all of the data and try and analyze it, and then you'll throw it back to the people who came up with the hypothesis to start saying, so what what's there what next where do we take it next so what we were able to do because we had this dashboard this online sort of graphical dashboard with it was we were able to go back to amy and her colleagues and kim and, and some of our colleagues as well and, and really get into a workshop and start teasing it start trying to say well what does that mean how do we drill down into this how do we drill down into that and we probably went through an iterative, iterative process of, you know, over a period of another, again of another couple of months two to three months in parallel with which Kim, and in conjunction with Amy, was able to start drawing the thoughts out, preparing the materials. Uh, and we pretty much had everything to go, uh, ready to go. Uh, and then just before the, the publication, uh, we, we were able to sort of, you know, just take another year's worth of data, uh, which Amy had just published, uh, and, and just sort of say, right, let's just, now we know exactly what we're looking at, what we're doing, we can just take that set. And well, within a couple of weeks, we're able to take that 
final year's worth of data and include them uh, into the data set, then we were very happy to see that it just reinforced and, <laughs> and, and added to the hypothesis and the story we'd already pretty much written. Fantastic. Thank you so much for great teamwork, I can see. Um, so look, let's look at the results. So based on the study, Kim, what was the performance rating of European agency client relationships? Yes, well, it was uh, interesting, um, you know, because we had only until uh, we uh, started engaging with European uh, uh, agency and client networks, we had only looked at this from a global perspective and hadn't really thought about looking at it on a, on a region uh, by region basis. But we were happily surprised, if you like, to see that the score the average score of European winning agencies relative to the, 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 the non-winners was four points higher than the global average score and, uh, and uh, two points higher uh, for European clients. So I guess what this suggests is that the result that you know, uh, better relationships deliver more effective work or are more evident in the award winners circle is more evident and emphasized in Europe than it is anywhere else in the world. Generally, we find uh, European clients and agencies tend to be tougher scorers. They're, they're harder scorers of each other's relationships, particularly when we compare them with North Americans. Um, so I, I think that probably explains why when the, the scores are conservative to begin with, when you do have an excellent client agency relationship that goes on to win effectiveness awards, there is quite a significant jump. Interesting. Well, that's amazing to hear. Great. Thank you, Kim. So Amy, um, where do winning agencies excel and why do you think so? And obviously also if you could elaborate that from the client perspective as well. Yeah, sure. So, um, I think what this research shows us is, well, there's two areas that I'd highlight. The first is that award-winning agencies are scored highly by their clients in the basics. So like we were saying, they manage the account well. Yes, they're scored highly in the marketing-specific disciplines too, but they excel in the process stuff, particularly the financial management, the project planning, scoping, timelines. So it's not the glamorous disciplines, but it's these areas that take the tension out of the relationship. Um, which gives then space for for the magic to happen on top, if you like. Um, and the second area to highlight, and this applies for both agencies and clients, is, is in strategy. So the results showed that when agencies score their clients, um, there's a significant gap in strategic thinking between the average and the winning clients. And I think this, the fact that strategy scores highly for both agencies and for clients shows that it's a collaborative discipline that there needs to be connected between you know, a client's corporate or, or their business strategy with the marketing strategy that an agency might present that's then embraced and driven forward by the client, iterated and optimized by the agency. So, so it's very cyclical in nature uh, and the results of this study kind of bear that out. Amazing. Thank you. Um, Paul, maybe over to you now. Um, you have also identified a few core behaviors defining a team's performance. So what mm -hmm. are those behaviors, please? Okay. We stood back a while, a while ago, we, we stepped back and we, we really sort of did a lot of research to, to look at and say, well, what are, how do high performing teams, you know, behave? Because we don't evaluate individuals, we, we evaluate teams. And so we wanted to understand what it was about teams that, 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 that made them effective. So after some research, we, we came up with a, with a series of what we call behaviors that, that, that high performing teams exhibit. And those are accountability, which is that a, a high-performing team will define who is accountable for what, so the roles are clear, but they will also be accountable for executing those roles, for actually carrying out that work. High-performing teams challenge. They challenge the status quo, uh, and they, they'll challenge thinking as well, which is the most important part of, of that. Um, they'll, they won't put up with, uh, with bad behavior. They'll challenge bad behavior, but more, most significantly, They'll challenge thinking. They'll, they'll look for creative destruction, if you like. They're, they're looking for for breaking through and pushing back and, and, and trying to really force the uh, force the game on. High-performing teams communicate. They're good at communication, which means they communicate openly. They communicate often. 
their communications off tend to be more fact-based than opinion-based. Um, and they're, they're open and they're honest. So there's, there's good, clear, open and regular communication going on. Goal setting is the, the next one. Very important. We see that a lot. And if you read, you know, self-development stuff and career improvement stuff, a lot of it is about goal setting. Well, the same is equally true at team, team levels, high performing teams clearly identify the goals they're aiming for, and then they measure and they, they monitor where they are against achieving those goals and take corrective action in order to, to continue to try and achieve goals. Um, High-performing teams are, are trustworthy. They behave with integrity. They're honest, they're open. They, you know, they are, they are, as the thing says, they are trustworthy. And we see that a lot. That is one of the highest performing values that we see, behaviors we see. Um, one that we uh, added in as a result of COVID, we, we started to thinking about well, which teams are going to behave well, which teams are going to perform well once we, when we went into COVID and we went into this whole new world. Uh, and so we have added a new, uh, a new uh, behavior at that point called resilience, which, which really identifies those teams who can, who can withstand the crisis and bounce back. And that's about flexibility, adaptability, response to change. And things like that, and which we which was which is now proven we, we've kept. We haven't removed it as, as part of the COVID thing. Uh, now COVID, now we're ha very fortunate to be past COVID. Uh, we, uh, we we've kept that one in because we still see that as very very important. So those were the main ones that we initially came up with, uh, and then we realised we were missing one, uh, and, and that actually is one we call functional, because despite the fact that you might have a team of football players who are a team. They might be brilliant at all of those other things. So they might actually, you know, really trust each other, be have clear roles defined by the positions they play on the pitch almost, if you like. They communicate well with each other. They challenge each other to get behavior. They've got performance goals and all the rest of it. But if none of them can actually kick a football, they're never going to win a trophy. So the functional one is actually about being good at the core job. You, you, as well as having a lot of those soft behaviors, in order to be a high-performing team, you've actually got to be, have a good, strong competency at the day job. Fantastic, Paul. So maybe then based on that, so which of these behaviors you observed um, are basically characterizing winning agencies and clients in Europe? So are there specific uh, behaviors of these two that you mentioned that are standing okay. out? Um, yeah. if, you, if you could maybe it's... elaborate on that. And if I may, also, what does this mean with the increasing appearance of AI? If you can maybe okay. also uh, look let's, at this. Let's aspect. start with which ones stand out. There's two that stand out for different reasons. When we look at the scores that uh, the clients, when we carry out our evaluations, that when we look at the uh, the behavior scores, the clients award agencies and agencies award um, clients, uh, we see that the highest score tends to be on, on trust. Um, so we know that trust is just a fundamental of, 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 of good relationships. It's a really, really important part of it that we see time and time again. But when we laid on, layered on and looked at the difference between those scores and the winning scores, we found the one that really made the difference between the, the overall scores and the European winning scores was challenge. This was true both for clients working with agencies, but also agencies challenging clients as, as, as well and clients challenging agencies. The same is absolutely true both ways. Challenge stood out um, clearly as the the key differentiator between those winning awards and those not. Now, when it comes to AI, AI, I think, is a, a fascinating new tool, just really now, I would say, just beginning to reach, uh, I, I would say, not, not adult, but not maturity yet, but, but, but probably just, just coming out of childhood, just, just entering its teenage years. Where we're now, rather than just being, oh, that's an interesting tool, it's now really becoming a, a potentially has the potential of becoming a very useful day-to-day -day tool as well. But when we look at those challenges, those, those behaviours that we've talked about, they're quite soft things. They're they're very personal and people-related re things. They're very human things, um, particularly things things like trustworthiness um, and challenge. In particular, challenge that that ability to to come up with something new, to come up with something different, to not accept what we're talking about. Um, it, it, as part of the analysis that we did, one of the interesting things that, that Kim did was, was to ask the, one of the most famous AI tools, ChatGPT, you know, is, <clears throat> is client agency relationships, you know, uh, in, are they important and so forth? And, 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 and 
Um, right, we were very pleased to see that the chat beach UPT agreed and said yes, there was a significant significant importance to them, and they were uh, they did need to be worked on and managed and so forth. But I'm, in some ways, I'm very pleased that it said that, but I'm I'm not surprised because we know that that is the overwhelming. You know, a lot of people have done research on that, not just us. We know how we all know how important that is, and the all the materials that ChatGPT GPT would have been drawing on from across the internet, which is where all, all, the, all the papers out there and so forth that it's gathering its responses from, would be saying that. So it's coming up with something which is a very very useful piece of very quick research. And, and distilling that into a well, you know, humanly readable uh, insight, but it hasn't challenged me. It hasn't actually gone completely left field and come up with something completely different, which is what we're seeing as the really, really important part. They really, you know, the the from the, the app from the from the agency perspective, that that's about challenging the thinking, and, and from within the uh, from from within the client side, it's 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 about challenging the strategy and coming up with that creative strategy that 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 governing thought and theme and direction which which uh, is only really possible based from all the from from the human insight and the human knowledge now yes. who knows what it will be in 10 years I think absolutely we'll have a different conversation there but thank thank you so much paul that's very 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 um interesting um maybe the next one uh, then for for kim in terms of uh, teamwork so what should companies do to foster complete and successful cohesion of their teams? So what is important um, as such when, when we think about the work, what makes basically a team work? Yeah, well, I think Paul's probably answered much of that already uh, because the seven behaviors that we identified were not just simply plucked out of the air. These were arrived at through trawling through and doing um uh, running algorithms against our 26,000 evaluations and finding the, the, the link between these behaviors and the scores, the better scores that were being achieved. And so I think, to, to put it simply, if, if, if teams can look at those seven behaviors, communication, challenge, accountability, trust, goals, resilience, and functional skills, and make sure that they are performing against all of those, I think that's a jolly good start. Um, but I guess over and above that, um, I think, uh, you know, if we look at the pressures that teams are under today, individuals and teams are under today, um, we talk a lot about mental health. And I, I personally think that um, mental health is becoming a core responsibility for any employer whether that be a marketer, an agency, or someone in aerospace, doesn't matter. Um, we need to understand that mental health is now an issue. It's out and we have to deal with it and we're responsible for it. So in that context, <clears throat> what I found really interesting looking at some research, and then I have to say an ever-increasing body of research that's now sort of ramping up, is the correlation between happiness, employee happiness, and productivity, um, and it, you know, various bits of research, including some that I particularly uh, found interesting from Warwick University in the UK, showed that happier people are X percent more productive than people who are not so happy. They also did the contra the, the the contrary, and they looked at unhappy people. And their productivity was naturally lower. So it's not just a matter of um, happy people are more productive. Unhappy people are significantly less productive. So I think it, it behoves us all uh, to try to foster a sense of happiness. And that happiness doesn't necessarily mean laughing. It doesn't necessarily mean frivolous party games or going out on, you know, uh, on, on parties uh, incessantly. It just means removing uh, irritants that will stop people from being happy. It means making sure that the working situation, the environment, the conditions are all conducive to optimizing happiness. And I, I think you know that's a very, very important thing going forward. Thank you, Kim. 
And maybe, uh, Amy, a uh, last question, or what, what would you think could we add to what just actually Kim and Paul said about the behaviors, the man, the health, the happiness? Um, what, what, according to you, are the study's implication for businesses and what should brands and agency focus on, according to the report? Sure. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite a big question to answer succinctly because there's so much in the report, but, but I'll do my best. Um, so I think the first implication might be quite obvious, but it's a point worth making that the agencies and clients need to work on the strengths of, of their relationships um, and that will lead to stronger work. Um, now, where they do that, there, there are two areas. We've seen that getting the basics of management right means that agencies and clients can focus on the things that sets them ahead of their competitors. And and when I say basics of management, that also includes the things that we've been talking about. So so the mental health aspects, the working environment, you know, ensuring that um, that people are happy doing the jobs that they're doing. Um, that that's included in in management. So getting the management right um, means that you know there's there's that space to um, for for them to do great creative work. Um, so financial account management, general management, um, and then there are then there are three things that set uh, the winning relationships apart. So like I was saying before, strategy and on both sides of the equation. And then by those key behaviors um, that Paul was talking about, so trust and challenge. So trusting your partner, but also challenging them. Um, again, on both sides of, of the relationship. Um, and obviously um, these things are all interlinked. Um, so having um, having strength in strategy means, means challenging it at times, um, but it also means trusting the process. So it's clearly a balancing act. No one thing is gonna suddenly lead to, to winning awards, but I think if you start with making sure that the basic processes um, are in place, um, that that colleagues are are happy and, and in a good place to do their work, that the strategy is collaborative um, and that enables those behaviors like trust and challenge to develop. Fantastic. I couldn't have said this better. <laughs> Good. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your insights and also for having actually conducted that uh, very uh, useful piece of research. Uh, thank you so much on behalf of EAC and everyone else. Mm -hmm.